When considering applications of linear differential equations, and specifically non-homogeneous ones, another classic example is the deformation of a loaded beam. And we have some nice illustrations here. Imagine something driving over a bridge where there's a beam that's supporting that bridge. How much is that beam going to bend under different loads? There's a more human scale example here. This is over the Grand Canyon. It's this U-shaped cantilevered uh, extension where people can terrify themselves by looking through a glass floor here and look down straight down into the valley. In addition to these very obviously beam-like structures, you can also consider structures like airplane wings. They are subjected to loads, hopefully, of lift when you're flying, and that means that these beams or these wings are under stress and strain, and again we'd like to know by how much are they deflecting under various conditions. Now the physics of beam deformation is not central to this course at all. Uh, it's fairly involved, it would at least take a lecture or so to get into that side of things. It's interesting, but not what we're focusing on in this course. So for our purposes, we're going to jump straight to the answer in our perspective, which is the differential equation. The differential equation is surprisingly simple. If we have a beam that's stretched across here, and we're applying load to it at various locations, then it's going to deform, so it's going to bend a bit. And literally, y as a function of x is going to be the solution. The actual shape of this beam is going to be given as a formula. What do we know from the physics, though? We don't know the formula, but we can determine that the fourth derivative of the shape of this curve is going to be equal to p of x, which is the loading on a per unit uh, width basis. What that means is we can decide whether there's a constant load or a uniform load or a load more towards one end, all these other things. Those would show up in the p of x term. The other two terms here, e and i, are material properties for the e, Young's modulus of elasticity of whatever the beam is made of, and i is the moment of inertia or something to do with the cross section of the beam if we looked at it end on. What you'll notice first from a differential equation standpoint, of course, is that this is a linear constant coefficient, assuming that E and I are constants, that we have a common beam across the whole thing, constant coefficients, and non-homogeneous. Because the load, P of X, represents the external load or the forces being applied to the beam, and they end up on the right-hand side because they're not involved with the internal mechanics. In looking at this equation and comparing it back to the spring system, notice that the force balances that are intrinsic to the beam itself, or if you think of the spring system, the mass times acceleration, the spring force, the damping force, all ended up on the left-hand side, and the external force ended up on the right-hand side. And we see the same kind of structure here, and that is a very common form for these equations to take. Internal stuff on one side, and the external force being by itself on the right-hand side. All right, now if we believe this equation is true, and it is, then let's go ahead and see what we can do about solving it. Notice that we have a very, very simple differential equation here. If we're going to solve it, we would need to do two things. We'd need to find the non-homogeneous part of the solution, and also the complementary solution. Well, for the complementary solution, we're simply solving ei y to the 4, fourth derivative, equals 0. We're again replacing the right-hand side with its non-homogeneous equivalent, a corresponding non-homogeneous equation. With that in mind, how would we go about solving that? Well, we'd use our y equals e to the r. This is a function of x in this case, so e to the rx. And we would obtain e i r to the fourth equals 0. Well, we can just cancel out the e's and i's there. That's fine. And so we just have r to the 4 equals 0. Well, that seems a bit surprising, but that really means we have 0 as a root, 0 as a root, <laughs> 0 as a root and zero as a root four times. Well, what does that mean for our solution? Well, our corresponding or complementary solution will be made of these building blocks, and these r's go into the e to the rx, so we'd have c1 e to the 0x plus 
We'd like to have another zero e to the zero x, but we can't because we already have one. We need something that's linearly independent. Well, we saw we just multiply by x to get a new solution that also works, but that is distinct or linearly independent from the previous one. Well, that's two roots. Well, guess what? We'd like a third one and we would like a fourth one. How are we going to build four solutions out of this? Well, instead of having x out front, we'll have an x squared in the next term. And in the last one, we'll have an x cubed in front of the e to the zero x. Those four functions are all linearly independent and they all match the r values we found before. And in fact, we can simplify those because e to the zero is just one. So we're gonna have c1 plus c2x plus c3x squared plus c4x cubed. Well, that's an interesting discovery. Even though we assumed the function was going to be an exponential when we did our analysis of the corresponding complementary solution, what we end up with is a polynomial. So that means the shape of the beam as it deforms is going to be described perfectly, in this case here by a cubic polynomial, if there's no load on it. Now we have to go one step further and apply a load. We'll see that through an example.